Welcome to Crunch Time, a program dedicated to helping you survive the crunch times in your life, whether they are caused by accidents, natural disasters, poverty, economic recession, depression, or all-out economic collapse, or whether they are caused by your realization that today's food supply is being contaminated by artificial fertilizers, pesticides, and genetically modified organisms, and over-processing of crops into what can hardly be called food. We want to help you through the crunch times in your future by teaching you what we have learned about organic gardening, food storage, and food preparation. We'll bring you into our kitchen and into our garden and share with you what we have learned, hopefully, before your crunch times arrive. Now here is Chef Francois. Last week, after a brief introduction, we viewed the first segment of the Squash Fest class that I taught for my church group. Then we took a snapshot tour of our garden. This week, I'd like to continue with the next segment of the Squash Fest class and then give you a short tour of a, my previous garden in a congested residential subdivision which gets four hours or less of sunlight in the summer and almost none on the winter solstice. Here I have grown vegetables from March to January and surprisingly had some good harvests of some vegetables and not so good with others. Before we take the tour, let's continue with the squash fest with Chef Francois. And I have other food stored that I grew in the garden, which include frozen veggies. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you freeze them, do you just like freeze them or do you blanch them first? You've got to blanch them. If you don't blanch yeah. something first, <laughs> yeah. supposedly it, the enzymes will break it down. Some right. things like kale leaves, mm -hmm. I tried some blanched and I tried some not blanched. Yeah. And the ones not blanched, I took out two or three weeks later and Sorry. I ate it as a, as a fresh salad and it was perfectly fine. Oh, really? Yep. Um, <clears throat> these radishes, you're going to want to blanch them first. Yeah. And while you're blanching them, you might as well get them all the way to tender. Because there's no reason for you to have to warm them back up and boil them some more mm -hmm. to be able to make them into whatever you're going to use. Now, radishes lose that radish taste when you boil them. When you what? Boil them. When you boil them. Praise God. What do they yes. taste like after that? <laughs> oh, I made pies, wow. sweet pies, out of these radishes. Oh, wow. Here. Interesting. Okay, and only flavored with vanilla. Wow, that's awesome. They were great. Okay, in survival yeah, mode, vanilla. vanilla might not be available. So then Vanilla why? <laughs> might be one of those yeah, spices that you want to right. stuck on. Yeah. Because they just it's just a bottle. Okay, how about cinnamon? Where am I work? Okay, I didn't put cinnamon in those. Yeah. I had just vanilla. Or cloves. You All right, cloves let me get on. Let me get on to these. Yeah, you move along. All right, okay. frozen veggies yeah. uh, and shelved fruits like the squash mm -hmm. and the pumpkins. Mm -hmm. This is winter squash. I had some zucchini, but I didn't expect that it was going to last long, so I just so sliced it, like it up and, and dried it. You what? have that kind of squash now that would grow for winter, could it? You can't plant it now. It won't oh, grow now. Okay. It's got to have hot weather. A hot winter. Hot weather. Oh, I see. Stuff like winter. cabbage, cabbage sort of stuff. Yeah, like cabbage stuff grow. will survive. It won't grow. No. It'll just survive. How about Jerusalem artichokes? Artichokes, I don't think. I think they, I they go pretty far into the fall. I know that. All right. This takes about 75 to 90 days to get from a seed mm -hmm. to a good fruit. This is a medium sized one. I've got some that are bigger around that I can't reach around with my fingers wow. with both hands. Mm -hmm. And I've got some that are tennis ball and smaller. They mm -hmm. say tennis ball size is when you're supposed to pick them, but I let them grow. Uh, the baseball there. Daikon. This is an excellent, excellent root crop. This here is 45 to 60 days. Wow, that's good. And this is a small one. What, did, what does it taste like? Is it, it's is it like a, a mild, mild, days? mild radish. It tastes almost like a turnip. Oh, okay. Like a parsnip. Now you call them No, dry not cups. a parsnip. Does parsnip is sweet. Parsnip oh, yeah, is very sweet. Parsnip, I tried to plant a whole field of them, 
and only four plants came up and I'm saving them to get fresh seeds next fall or next spring and then I'm going to try to plant those. From from seed, how many days was this? 45 days to get a good size one. Okay. And this is a small one. Okay. But they need that weather okay. too? I've got some that were two and a half pounds. They were the size of a baseball bat. Wow. They ended up being hollow on the inside. They were so big. Ah. Mm. And you try to get them before that. Before they try to get them this big. Yeah. This one is bruised a little bit on top. You can see we need to do something with it tonight. We're going to make some coleslaw. Does that go by another name? The Chinese radish. Daikon is spelled D A I K O N. That grows below the surface. It, when you first plant it, only leaves are sticking up, but by the time you harvest it, this much is sticking up. Oh, so you can see it. Okay. That's it, it grows right up. And then you grab a hold it and pull it up. And you can see it. Okay, and with most of the vegetables, do you, do you find the, the smaller they are, the more tender they are? You know, the better tasting they are, or no? No, I don't find it. No, you don't? Okay. Beets. Bigger ones are tender mm -hmm. until you get so big they start getting woody on the inside. Oh, you don't okay. want to get that. Okay. Okay. Uh, these radishes. Uh, oh, all right. Okay. Yeah. Well, like zucchini, I find if I, I, I have I, the smaller ones. This big around and that long. Really? And yeah. You find those just as tasty as the small ones? I never had a small oh. one. Oh. oh. No, small ones oh. are better. I, well, I, I love them the way they are. I love them the way my okay. Chinese neighbor picks them the, off the branch. The small so. ones just have less seed in them. And, probably. And, well, that's and the probably. smaller seed, but they have less seed and more meat. And the, But the bigger they get, the bigger the seed gets, the yep. bigger it takes yep. up And the seeds the are center. seeds are tender enough to just eat them just the way they are. All right. Uh, let me see here. Oh. Rutabagas, soybeans, potatoes, and sweet potatoes. Potatoes are easy to grow once you prepare the ground. You just put them in and walk away. And you don't even have to keep watering them like I do everything else. Uh, and then at the end of the year when it, everything's brown, then you go in there and you dig them up. What about this you know, mounding potatoes? thing you're supposed to do with potatoes? It uh, depends on how your ground is. If your ground is hard, then you can't just plant the potato two or three inches into the ground and expect it to put roots down and then push all that hard stuff out of the way for the potato. So when you got hard ground, you've got a well two ways to do it. One is to plant them shallow and then keep mounding them as the greens start growing up, or make a ditch, put them in the bottom of the ditch, and then keep filling in the ditch until the green. But I've got sandy soil and I really fluff it up. Okay. When I prepare my garden, no matter what I'm plant, planting, even strawberries, which only go down three inches, I prepare that 18 inches deep fluff. Oh. If you walk on it, you're going to sink in at least six inches. I, I do that for my flowers, so yeah. that makes sense so, to me. When you got them like that, all you got to do is put the potato in there three inches down and it'll send stuff down and it'll make room for the potatoes as long as it can compress stuff. All right, the easiest fruit and vegetable to store is the winter squash. This one right here. It's the easiest one to store. And I had one last winter that I kept all the way till June of this year before I finally ate it. Wow. I already had these plants out that far before I ate my last squash. So they will last. Uh, so where'd you keep? But you've got to keep checking them because if you get a bruise and it rots this one and it's leaning up against that one, oh, it's yeah. going to rot that one. So I've got them all on a shelf in the basement. Okay. Last year I just had them on the yeah, floor of the basement. One band and as a bunch. <laughs> Shao Lee yeah. just puts them on the basement floor. <clears throat> so, like you, you said, you had to use these, but th is that because they're bruised? That's because they're going to go bad. Okay, because they've been bruised or bitten into or yep. whatever. Yep. But if they're blemish free, they'll stay for a long time. This one here has got a little scratch right here. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's going to cause something or not. It hasn't so far. Nothing on the bottom has caused anything so far. Mm -hmm. I don't trust so it, it's so I'm going to keep checking. the severity of the blemish. This one here, 
it's pretty rough on the bottom. Mm -hmm. It's got some chew marks here. I expect this one to go bad. I'm surprised it hasn't already. You know, this part looks a little deformed already. Uh, maybe it's drying out and it's, I don't know. Okay. But it's good right now, so if I see a mar, I'm going to eat that one. And mm -hmm. save the best ones for the longest time. Oh, gotcha. All right, back to the... So script. what about the one that had black mold on it? What caused that? Um, moisture oh, okay. and sugar. Mm -hmm. Now the sugar in the in the uh, pumpkin is it's gonna make black mold. Mm -hmm. All right, winter squash grows on the vine as a dark green fruit, just like this. I picked this one today. In fact, it's supposed to have been raining this afternoon, and so I picked eight of these. Does that have a mark on it? That yeah, it's teeth marks from a squirrel, a rabbit. Uh, I think it's a squirrel. You can, you have to I don't know. Get teeth. It's Avarmit. definitely teeth marks. Yeah. And uh, anyway, Excuse me, the vines. Do you want me to turn the oven on? To no, get it ready? no, I never turn the oven on until I put something in. I don't oh. waste heat ever. Amen. And I coast. Ten, the last 10 minutes of cooking is always coasting it. I never take it out when the oven's hot. Wow. I always coast it. Um, all right, when you take it off the vine while it is still dark, uh, you can take it off the vine while it's still dark green, but it's better to get it to ripen on the vine if you can keep it out of too much rain and away from pests like ants, mice, crickets, etc. Um, I think this here might have been crickets. Right there. Wow. Oh, uh, yeah. Wow. I think that may have been from crickets. Oh, wow. Uh, always wondered what that That was. one is yeah. about the way you want to harvest it. <clears throat> okay, the bottom part is always going to be yellow the longest. And you want to store them in the same position that they were sitting in the garden. You don't oh, want to turn really? them over. Oh, oh. And so uh, this one here was on that side, and the sun ripened this. And usually you've got two seasons of uh, crop. You know, you're going to have one or two really, really hot weeks in July. And during those hot weeks, you won't pollinate any flowers. If the flowers come out, they will all abort because they'll just be too hot. All the leaves will just like this. You spray water on them, and you plant, and you water the pit twice a day, and they're still going to be down during that time. You're not going to get anything to pollinate. Uh, if it does, if, if a female flower comes out, basically a female flower looks like a, a flower, and it's got a miniature one of these on it, and the flower is right here, and the pistil is like five pistils instead of one. The male flower has only got one pistil. And, uh, and the male flowers are closer to the roots. But uh, you'll have one season where you'll, you'll harvest maybe five or six of these out of each plant before it gets hot. And during that time when it's getting hot is when you're going to be pulling them in because they're going to get so hot, they're going to Spoil. have a problem. <laughs> so uh, once they start turning this chalky color, uh, dusty, that's when you pull them in. And then after that hot season is over, you're going to have another whole season where they're going to, they're going to start putting out the female flowers again, they're going to start pollinating, you're going to start having them. And then by the end of the season, you're going to have a whole bunch of little ones like this, or smaller. But I've got some at home that's five pounds. This one here is probably two. Whoa, whoa. I've got one that's twice as big down here and twice as big up here and it's about that long. I've got two of them that are about this big, and they have a big circle all the way around like that. Oh, why don't you it's bring about five pounds. I probably will. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Uh, where was I? The male, the female, the. the uh, All right. Keep them away from the pests. You got to get them in yeah. before the pests get after them. Yeah. They get too sweet, they'll start getting eaten, either by crickets or ants or, or vermin. All right. While being stored, it will lose its green and turn the light pinkish orangish tan like that. This one is a little more orange than normal. It would go about like that. And on my shelf right now, almost all of them are that color, even though they went in like this. Hmm. Went in green, they're already uh, that color. How long has you had them in? Yeah. About a month. Oh, yeah, it, it started turning within the first couple of weeks. I leave the ones that I recently picked. I leave out in the sun right now mm -hmm. on my porch oh. where the rain's not going to hit them, but the sun is. Mm -hmm. okay. I leave them right out there. I got probably two dozen out there right now. Well, when you say on your shelf, are you talking like in the basement or yeah? What, is that what you yeah. mean? Yeah, yeah. I went to Lowe's and got eighty-nine dollars for Shelby. two foot by four foot by six foot high shelf, five shelves. The only problem is they're particle board, and if you put a whole rows of canning jars on there, oh, yeah, it's going to go. Oh, done. Oh, it's done. Yeah, they make plastic. And then they all slide ones. to the middle, and then they all That's crash true. through. That are more so are i got to replace that That's one shelf with some plywood. How about the wood? 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 Oh, man, it's it's rust. It will. Yeah. It's plastic. Ones. Especially if I can get somebody else besides me to eat this stuff. This long, you're probably oh. that deep. Um, the long one. All right. I have puree in the freezer that was made from an unripe squash. That's the green one. Okay. It, this stuff is separating because it's been sitting in the freezer. Um, mm -hmm. It's green. It looks like pea soup. The other one looks like bright orange. Uh, did you do it with a blender or food processor? I did it with a blender. Okay. And it's the cheapest blender sold by. Walmart, which is about thirteen dollars and fifty-eight cents, and I can burn it up the first day I use it if I push it. Well, you should have been using Chinese cabbage. Chinese cabbage, because it would go well on a Chinese blender. Chinese cabbage, right here. This there here is go. called Napa. Napa. I'm going to make some coleslaw here in a minute. All right. Well, being stored, it will lose its green flavor. Yeah, okay. A puree, dark green, perfectly fine. Doesn't look appetizing, but it does. Uh, I always use the skin. It's got the vitamins in it. I never peel the skin off of a pumpkin or a squash uh, or most of a rutabaga. This thing here, I'll pull off this rough spot here because there's spots in there that dirt could hide, but the rest of it, I just scrub it with a brush. I'll use the whole thing. Just cut it up into dice, boil it, and then make my pie or whatever. If you steam those, you, you, yeah. it, the flesh them, would yeah. be it, it, the flesh will be a lot denser than if Tougher. you boil it. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Uh, if I cut this up today. You'll find out how dense this stuff is. Mm -hmm. That's why it took 90 days to grow this one, and it only took, you know, the same size, a little over half the time, yeah. to grow that one. Mm -hmm. This one's much more dense. Do you ever use like a juicer? You know, one of those no. juicer things? No, I don't. Don't have a juicer. And I'm trying Me to, either. like I. This is going to be my blender. Mm -hmm. It's a potato masher. Yeah. That's what I'm going to use for a blender tonight. And that's what <coughs> it's going to be my survival mode blender. Now that green <coughs> unripened squash is going to taste the same as the orange squash that was ripe? I got them right here. You can take a spoonful of each one and try it. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I take your word for it. That's <laughs> why I asked you. The reason I made the puree from the green one was because it had some kind of a defect like this. It was going to rot if I didn't do something. No, no, I understand why you did. I'm just that's on my script. I'm just no. wondering if, if the taste is if the taste is the same whether it's right it's, or it's not. It's probably slightly different. Oh, you haven't tasted it either. I'm taking. Well, well, you dip that I've spoon in there. I season it with with uh, cinnamon, so. sugar and cinnamon to taste. 
So if so it's got a it slightly matter. different taste, I'll probably end up putting more cinnamon in it I because got I got that certain yeah, taste that I, I wanted you. to get to before I quit putting cinnamon in it. So, I don't measure my cinnamon. So for that, it, it, it really, there's no difference then, really. If you're going to do that. For me, it's no different okay. because I'm not measuring my okay. cinnamon. I'm dumping it in, then okay. I'm trying it, and then I'm dumping some more in. We just got to keep moving to get cinnamon. <laughs> All right, some of the small fruits on the vine will abort if they are not pollinated or if it rains too much right after pollination or if they get stepped on. And when I say little ones, I'm talking four, five, six inches long. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll see them rot right there. Mm -hmm. They'll just fall right off. Yeah. Same thing with pumpkins, especially during that hot spell. All the pumpkins, I had at least a dozen pumpkins that were no bigger than this size of an apricot or kiwi and mm -hmm. they just rotted right there and fell off. Now isn't there a squash disease that you have to watch out for? Actually take the whole plant down? A what? A squash, a disease that squash can get. I would assume it, so, I, yes. Okay, I, I've seen it take. That's why we have never zucchini. ever grow in the same pit two years in a row. Okay. Okay, when we dig this two foot by three foot pit, mm -hmm. next year we're going to grow away from the fence, out here. Okay. The following year we're going to go next to it, over here, and the next one is going to be the next one uh -huh. over there. And then the fourth year we might go back there, or we might mm -hmm. take this yeah. corner here and this corner here. Yeah, it might be six have, years before we get back in the same pit. You can have beautiful zucchini one day and the next day go out and it's yep. the whole plant is just down it and the do squash that. is Absolutely. bad. Uh, uh, it's, yeah. Yes. When, when you said, uh, Fran, don't plant in the same spot, but you can plant another vegetable or you don't use that? Oh, yeah, you can plant you can, anything. But you can plant another vegetable but, in that spot. But my... But not pits. the same pump. My pits are outside of my garden where the lawn is so that they can stretch out onto the lawn yeah. and they're right on the edge and there's only so many spots in that area uh, that yeah. I can put them. Definitely. And I'm not going to plant corn there. Right. Oh, you know, okay. I, it's hard ground except for that one spot. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. But you can use it for another vegetable the following year if you want, just not to squash. Fine, yeah. Yeah, but you're, if you're putting a squash plant two feet away from it, it's going to overrun it and, and overshadow your other vegetable. Like if I put watermelon... So what's the purpose of not using the same pit? Rotating. Because of the disease. The fungus. Uh, whatever. The virus or whatever it is. So it could be you, dormant in there? Whenever there. you're planting, you never want to plant the same thing in the same spot. <laughs> Continuously. It's not a rotation. Not even oh. strawberries. You want to keep moving them. Moving them around. Now, asparagus, you have no choice. That takes four or five yeah. years. Right. And it stays there. Right. And you've got no choice for that. But anything that's annual or, or biennial, you want to move it. So next, next year, I'll need to take do my tomatoes not in that one spot, but yeah. the other exactly. end of each exactly. of the garden. You could get Swiss turkey. And the tomatoes, it's yeah. mainly because of the bugs. <laughs> yeah. the, the tomato uh, worm or whatever, but if it keeps worms. seeing them there, it, it'll dig down and make a hole and expect to find them again. Friend, uh, friend how do you, um, like, on, when you did do the squash, you said, you know, you put them, you let them grow out on the lawn because they spread. Yep. Uh, what happens to the, how do you cut the grass? You cut the or, grass you know, I mean, out beyond you, where it's reached. And then the next day, it's going to go out another foot. Oh, and you, it alone so much. It, you <laughs> just, <laughs> once it gets out there, the, the weeds and the grass will start growing up. <laughs> but it won't get a lot of sun because those leaves are huge and yeah. they're going to block oh, okay. all the sun. Okay, so you just but there is one weed that I've got in my area that used to have a forest there. And it had these vines that were reaching up and killing the trees. Mm -hmm. well, those vines grew this tall. Yeah. Right in the middle of the squash plot. Oh, okay. And I went over there and pulled them up. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Speaking of pollination, some of the squash we have were hand pollinated mm -hmm. with a Q tip. Oh, wow. Because there were no either no bees around yeah. or no matched male and female flowers. The first one of these I had in my house. I had female flowers before the male flowers. So I brought pollen from a pumpkin plant three and a half miles away at my other garden on a Q-tip on my bicycle 
over and pollinated that flower and got a squash out. Oh, God, love you. And got a squash out. Did you have your hybrid? Did you have your yeah. on that day? No. <laughs> so the male flowers usually come up first. They're a tall stem, Squonkin. a small flower, and one pistil on a small stem close to the roots. The female flowers are a little bigger, they're long, they're, they're on a short stem, they got five pistils in them, and they got a miniature fruit before the Where are flower. those pictures? I don't <laughs> I <laughs> would have to dig through all my pictures in my garden to find them, and I didn't. Okay. Next year. We want female and male flower pictures. Here we go. I pollinated my first three squashes at my house with pollen from male flowers in my main garden three and a half miles away. Uh, we even pollinated some winter squash with pollen from zucchini squash. That's a miracle. Wow. Or pumpkin. Okay, I told you earlier we were going to take a tour of my garden at home. This brown house on the right here is my house. Notice we don't have any big open areas to have a garden. In fact, this area right in front of us here, between the two houses, used to have a bunch of hemlock trees in there, almost as big as the birch tree that's still there. And we took out the hemlock trees and made a garden right up against the building. The only place is going to get any sun. You can see how big this, this uh, birch tree is. And so our garden right now is behind this little fence we have to the right here. And uh, I've got some cold frames set up. Uh, with glass that came out of some uh, French doors and I use those to uh, to protect the plants in the cold season and so they can still get some sun and sometimes it gets warm in there and uh, gee we've got an area in the back that's got uh, lettuce or not lettuce spinach and kale that we're going to be able to harvest all the way into January probably. And the front cold frame has got uh, some daikon, some rutabaga, and some radishes. You can see on the back of this front cold frame we have insulation board back there. So we've still got some plants out in the front that we're still harvesting as well, mostly radishes. And what we've got inside the cold frame, you'll see when I open up one of these shortly here, you're going to be able to see the um, rutabagas that we've got. So we've got kale and spinach in the back. The kale got eaten up pretty well with the cabbage worm, but the spinach is good. Here you can see some rutabagas in the back and daikons in the front. April 3rd, we still have two feet of snow on the ground. By the 26th, we have our spinach growing again and our kale. Now we've planted again by May 5th. By May 26th we have things growing. May 30th we have more things transplanted in there. And June 15th everything's growing well. By June 30th we start having vines out into the yard. Then by July 17th and July 20th we have all kinds of vines out in the yard. By the end of July, the tomatoes are so tall, they're taller than I am. Uh, August 10th, we have watermelons. And August 21st, the vines are out to the edge of my property. By the end of August, we're already pulling things up and transplanting. In the last minute of our show, I'd like to tell you about the real reason for this show. Jesus Christ, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Without Jesus as my Savior, I would not be confident entering into these trying times that lay ahead. If Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, I suggest you send me an email at crunchtime at roadrunner.com and ask me how you can join the God who loves you, his son Jesus Christ, and his disciples in everlasting life. For now, I say to you, God bless and keep you and yours. I'll see you next week on Crunch Time with Chef Francois.